North Korea announces plans to restart its main nuclear reactor, and Kim Jong-un threatens to attack both Seoul and the U.S. How should Washington react? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. When Kim Jong-il was succeeded by his son in December of 2011, any hopes of an improvement in relations between North Korea and the U.S. were soon dashed. The announcement of plans to reopen the Yongbyon nuclear complex is just the latest move in an escalation of aggressive actions by both Washington and Pyongyang over recent months. At the weekend, North Korea announced it was entering a state of war with the South. Earlier in the month, Pyongyang affirmed its right to launch a preemptive nuclear strike on the U.S., the U.S., for its part, has conducted several joint military exercises with South Korea, mimicking the bombing of North Korean targets and the removal of its leadership. The U.S. military has conducted practice sorties of nuclear-capable stealth bombers over the Korean peninsula. On Monday, the U.S. deployed a warship with the capability to shoot down missiles into the region. However, the White House has played down the possibility of any imminent attack from the North, stressing no evidence of large-scale military mobilization had been seen. On Tuesday, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon offered to facilitate peace talks to resolve the crisis. High-level discussions haven't been held since Pyongyang exited the so-called six-party talks process in 2008. I'm joined from Denver by Christopher Hill, Dean of the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. He's a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State and Ambassador to South Korea and served as lead American negotiator at the six-party talks with North Korea. From Atlanta, Hanshik Park is Professor of International Affairs at the University of Georgia. He has extensive experience negotiating between the U.S., North and South Korea. In 2003, he helped secure Jimmy Carter an invitation to visit North Korea. And here in the studio is Steve Clemens, Washington Editor-at-Large for The Atlantic. So we have so much first-hand experience here with us um, during other occasions in which, um, which have been billed as potential crises. So I thought I'd get your opinions on what we're going through right now and just how serious a stage we're at. Professor, Han, uh, Professor Park, rather, how serious is uh, this, this, this current moment right now in U.S.-Korean relations? Uh, I think this time, I have been observing the situation for decades, this time it's a little different. Uh, I think it's uh, quite serious in the sense that uh, Kim Jong-un actually cornered himself. Uh, he doesn't seem to have a whole lot of wiggling room in domestic politics, in authority structure. So once he uh, uh, established this, uh, this corner, uh, he has to do something uh, before uh, backing down. And I think backing down is a very difficult for domestic uh, situation. So this is a quite unique. Uh, what we do you have mean, never seen this before. What do you mean by doing something? So he's doing something that, that is uh, militarily something. In fact, he made it very clear. Uh, they cannot accept this, this same kind of limbo, not war, not peace. In the meantime, for decades, they have been penalized and sanctioned and so forth, the economy isn't going anywhere. Unlike his father, who established the military, first the politics and uh, actually all the military arsenals uh, were developed under Kim Jong-il. Uh, Jong of course, his father, Kim Il-sung, was the founder, so more ideological legitimacy was established by him. But the Kim Jong-un current leadership, his life, political life hinges on his economic contribution. In order to do economy, he has to do something about the security. So I think behind all these rhetorics and uh, posturings and all that, what does North Korea really want? I think North Korea wants economic expansion through peacemaking with, uh, with the United States. You know, it, they, will, they will comply to any kind of invitation to, uh, to discussion table uh, where the agenda includes uh, peace treaty. So right. I think that's the way we should go. But, but Ambassador Hill, I mean, that's why some don't think that this will necessarily lead to some sort of military action on the part of North Korea, but is in fact trying to push the U.S. into um, 
high-level talks, finally, on some of the outstanding issues of security that have long been North Korea's concern? Well, first of all, uh, back in 2005, when we had the uh, six-party talks, we put on the table every element that the North Koreans had asked about, whether it was cross-recognition, that is, diplomatic re uh, recognition of all states, uh, a peace treaty on the Korean Peninsula, a massive economic uh, assistance program, a massive energy program. We were prepared to do high-level uh, visits. We put it all on the table. The one issue that we've uh, insisted on from the North Koreans is denuclearization. We are not prepared to accept North Korea into the club of nuclear nations. Now, the North Koreans have made that pretty clear in, in recent months, perhaps in recent years, that they expect to be accepted into that club, plus they want to get all the other benefits. So our one condition is that they uh, denuclearize. We have not asked them to denuclearize ahead of uh, the sequence of, of issues that we've offered. We've been prepared to work with them on, on how they would uh, denuclearize along with receiving these various, uh, these various uh, things that they say they want. The trouble with the North Koreans is uh, you put something on the table because they say it's important to them, and then finally, when they get it, they don't seem to be interested in it well, anymore. Uh, clearly there's a lot I of think uh, I would agree. There's a lot of history to that, and I suppose both sides, it can be, it can be argued, have reneged on, on previous deals. But we'll get in a moment, though, to perhaps concrete ways forward, instead of just looking back in a moment. But Steve Clemens, first of all, how seriously is the Obama administration viewing this current escalation in words at the very least? I think they're taking it very seriously, and I don't think they're just worried about words. I, I, you know, our intelligence and, and, you know, someone like Chris Hill and Professor Park have been, been very involved in this. Our worry is it's not just the leader that's behaving differently, but institutions that surround the leader are behaving differently. And not to fall into sort of Donald Rumsfeld speak, but there used to be a predictable unpredictability in how North Korea behaved. Now we're entering a phase of unpredictable actions. And when, you know, we're very good you know, canary in the coal mine on this is China. And to see China's frustration and worry is very interesting and very disconcerting. Uh, and in my view, when you see things like the B-2 bombers fly over, you see the positioning uh, that Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel has taken on trying to position, you know, ballistic missile defense uh, protection along the west coast of the United States and in Alaska. And he was sort these, of ridiculed the, for that. These are, though, well, well, ridiculed or not, these are serious concerns and a ratcheting up where because of the behavior of this young man who's just taken over uh, the helm in North Korea, we're spending hundreds of millions do of dollars on this side. That's not a trivial action. And it's in a way, I think, demonstrated to communicate in a gentle way right now to North Korea, don't mess with us. We're putting serious resources. And so if they miscalculate or if they take some provocative action like the sinking of the South Korean sub, uh, which is on the table, if they were to take a similar like action, it's inconceivable to me that at that moment, South Korea, also under a new leader, would not take some action. And then you're in territory that we haven't right. been in with direct kinetic conflict uh, between these two. And, and I think the Obama administration is very concerned and they are, you know, not to use a cliche, but are preparing all options. And, uh, and the tilt is on the options we haven't thought about using in quite a long time. Well, look, I think perhaps because so much of this is speculative, perhaps the most fruitful way to use our remaining time is to look at ways forward in, in pushing a diplomatic track, assuming that there aren't any uh, sudden military uh, actions by North Korea. And, and I wonder, I mean, there, there has been a great deal of discussion um, about whether the U.S.'s current policy is working. The analyst uh, and academic and former journalist Mike Chinoy had an interesting article where he said one thing uh, that has to be escaped from is the pattern of coercion and sanctions, which he says in the past have only done the opposite of whatever the heightened pressure uh, was d designed to achieve. Those are his words. And I, I think Ambassador Hill will have some interesting thoughts on these. But th these are the examples he uses uh, as to how we shouldn't, or uh, certainly how the U.S. shouldn't move forward from here. Um, he goes back to 2005. The U.S. imposed sanctions on Banco Delta Asia, the Macau-based bank, where Pyongyang has many accounts. North Korea sought bilateral talks to resolve that issue. The U.S. then refused to engage, and the North then staged several missile tests in 2006. The U.S. responded with a tougher resolution at the U.N. Security Council. Kim Jong-il then ordered the country's first nuclear test. Following a missile launch by the North then, the U.S. tightened U.N. sanctions even further. North Korea responded with its second nuclear test, 
There was a third nuclear test in February. So Mike Chinoy's point then, Professor Park, is, look, this isn't working. This isn't... The, the sanctions and the coercion aren't working because you just get exactly the response you don't want, at least what the sanctions aren't supposed to achieve. What do you make of that argument? Well, sanc sanctions will never work. As long as they feel their national security is at danger, uh, they're, they're, they're not going to compromise what they consider to be the only deterrence, that's the nuclear preparedness. Time has changed. Ambassador uh, Hill uh, mentioned of 2005 and we had everything uh, on the table and so forth. Now North Korea has changed. In the meantime, they've tested on three occasions nuclear weapons. They have sent a satellite successfully, uh, at least uh, most recently. So this gives them a great deal of boost, uh, self-esteem as well as confidence. So right now, I think they are prepared to negotiate their nuclear preparedness away, facilities and bombs, everything, because now they know, uh, tested, they tested, now they have the military, the, the nuclearization uh, capability. They have science, technology, raw material. If, uh, if, if they need to, they, they, they can uh, begin from, uh, from scratch. So the, this gives me psychologically erroneous, uh, uh, quite, quite in uh, interestingly, uh, give the, uh, the self-esteem or uh, the confidence uh, that uh, they're, they're willing to uh, compromise right. on nuclear stand. Ambassador, what do you make of that argument then, that the further sanctions and coercion aren't going to work? That 2005 article, uh, uh, or example rather, about the Macau Bank is quite interesting because that was a time when you were thought to be making quite a bit of progress in part by not following the Bush administration's stated policy of not holding high-level direct talks. Then we had the sanctions and it was back to square one. Is that, is that an accurate way of looking at that? And should we draw some lessons from that? Well, first of all, the sanctions on Banco Delta Asia resulted in the freezing of some $23 million worth of North Korean accounts. They were eventually unfrozen. I would not look at that as a sort of seminal, uh, fundamental problem in this equation. I think the real problem has been the North Koreans accepted to denuclearize and have since decided to nuclearize. I really think it's important going forward that the U.S. keep the door open to negotiations. I think we've been doing that. Secondly, that the U.S. work very closely uh, with the South Koreans. After all, if the South Koreans perceive that somehow the alliance is weakening or somehow the U.S. doesn't care as much, then I think it could be even more destabilizing. So I think it's been very important that the U.S. exercise all three legs of the plan for defending South Korea, and that, that involves air, sea, and, and ground, and that's what we've been doing as we do every year. And thirdly, I think the U.S. Uh, needs to uh, work uh, more assiduously with China and see what can be done. China is the chair of the six-party talks, and I think uh, working with China, keeping the door open to the North Koreans, and assuring our allies, uh, South Korea and Japan, is the way forward. But I think the North Koreans need to understand that no matter how much they have paid or, or uh, uh, invested in these nuclear programs, we cannot allow a situation where North Korea becomes a nuclear power. After all, they are a country that have threatened other countries with nuclear annihilation over the issue of UN sanctions. No one likes UN sanctions, but for them to then threaten countries with nuclear annihilation over it, is an indication that this is one country in the world we do not want to see have nuclear weapons. But again, to, to, to try and avoid that from, from, from occurring, though, Steve Clements, as far as direct negotiations are concerned, I mean, there were reports that last year President Obama sent out delegations, at least two delegations. Well, that's why I don't completely agree with the sure. premise of the equation, that it's just sanctions and, and, and sort of a tough posture um, that we're considering because I think we've tried a variety of things. In fact, during Kim Dae-jung's time, we had, you know, much more uh, economic engagement. We had investment in North Korea. What we did not achieve in North Korea, it seems, is something like we've seen in places like Vietnam, in China, is a creation of elites that really want uh, the benefits of investment and a but, more liberal but the uh, also environment. The sunshine policy was sort of brought to an end because the Bush administration decided North Korea was an axis of evil just as the sun, you know, when these things were kind of getting That's in part there, true, so. but North Korea didn't help the situation. The, the point is that I think what Professor Park said, and I, and I in a respectful way disagree, uh, North Korea mocked uh, Muammar Gaddafi for giving up his nuclear program 
uh, said that hit the invasion of Libya uh, was in part due to him giving up those weapons. I think we've got a very tough, I agree completely with the notion that we need to try a variety of options. And I admire Ambassador Hill's sort of patience that you sort of hear in his you know, words as he talks about strategy here. But the, 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 the fact is you have a young man running a, a government that's trying to operate in CNN time. He seems very impatient for results that he can deliver. And, and North Korea largely exists through extortion. And it largely exists by creating trouble and being bought to not make that trouble. But he's raised the ante in very key ways that I think, as Chris Hill just said, particularly on the nuclear issues, that are red lines for us. Well, let's just be clear then uh, yeah. what, what are the red lines and what are the goals. Ambassador Hill then said so that is simply what the U.S. wants on the Korean Peninsula, North Korea's denuclearization. It doesn't want regime change then. The United States has been very clear. We want behavior change. We want them to denuclearize, and we're prepared to put a lot of things on the table and sequence those things such that we can get a fair and equitable agreement. And by the way, the North Koreans agreed to denuclearization uh, and uh, agreed to work with the other five countries of the six-party process. But, but does it seem a little counterintuitive then to have such a huge U.S. military presence playing so-called war games, uh, at, at pretending to have yeah, regime I change wish, in North Korea? I wish, yeah. yeah. You know, my only regret about U.S. exercises is I wish we had had them in the spring of 1950. Uh, we didn't, and North Korea brutally invaded South Korea. Thousands of people were killed. So I think having military exercises whose purpose is to defend South Korea are perfectly normal thing to do, the correct thing to do, and we should not be canceling them because the North Koreans are threatening us with nuclear annihilation. All right, or Professor at least Pop. annihilating, I guess, Waikiki. You've heard a range then of, 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 pol of possible policy options for the U.S. What do you make of those moving forward as opposed to uh, simply going for a different path off high-level direct negotiations? I, I think negotiation in this, uh, this, this time around needs to be uh, multifaceted. And uh, if you only high-level negotiation in front of television cameras and so, so forth, we cannot expect that much. We need to have a underwater diplomacy. We need to have uh, informal, unofficial contacts uh, all over the field. It is, it is so important. I, one thing important thing is North Korea now realizes that it cannot be accepted as a nuclear state. No one wants North Korea to go nuclear. China doesn't want that. The key question is China needs North Korea and wants North Korea to remain as a stable, prosperous communist state uh, for a number of reasons. So the question to Beijing is, do they want denuclearization more or uh, the maintenance of communist system more? I think it's a tough question. I think North Korea uh, so remaining as a communist state, Chinese ally, is something China wants the most. Right. So what does that mean? Is, is there that level of trust? Should there be that level of trust, though, that the U.S. isn't simply, frankly, about regime change in, in North Korea, that the North Koreans can treat the U.S. as... Uh, as credible partners in, in any plan to denuclearize the peninsula? Now, I, I, think, I think that is very crucial. North Koreans are so uh, worried about the possibility of North Korea become, becoming other Eastern European countries and Arab countries, implosion and all that. So uh, if there's any uh, suggestion that uh, we want North Korea to have reform and change and regime change, perhaps, North Korea is going to be behaving very difficultly. So we have to make sure that denuclearization is something we want at this time, rather than mixing up with the regime change. But Professor Park, I wonder what, how you think then President Obama's stated Pacific pivot has um, added to some of these tensions you know, it, on a peninsula where there's only an armistice and not a peace deal, for example, and uh, I, when, when China is yes, looking I, on. I think that is, uh, that is more tension being created between Washington and Beijing. Uh, I, I don't think North Korea is a vital uh, aspect here. Uh, if if uh, Beijing uh, wants to work with the rest of the countries there and work closely with North Korea, and I think uh, North Korea can be persuaded uh, so that the nuclear weapons can be compromised. 
I mean, the question, Steve Clemens, is we, you know, we've had loads of foreign policy discussions here about Iran and Israel-Palestine right. and all sorts of things <coughs> under the Bush administration. Sure. And the conclusion tends to be there hasn't been that sort of imagination, that leap of diplomatic imagination that is sometimes needed in order to, in order to get somewhere on, on these sorts of issues. I mean, is there any evidence that, 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 that these sorts of ideas are being thought of seriously and, and, and that this administration could do it? I mean, and, and to, to, to be honest, I don't, I don't see uh, evidence of that. And in part because whereas a country like Iran, where if you were able to imagine what you could do to make a strategic leap with Iran, whether Iran was going to be uh, supportive of that process or not, you can begin thinking of something like Nixon's you know, trip to China and normalization that might change the way the world looks at itself and the way global gravity works. In the particular case with North Korea, North Korea is essentially a client state of China. It is a troublesome state. It exists by extortion. Uh, in my view, but solving the North Korea problem doesn't necessarily make the rest of global patterns change. It is, it is a terrible uh, nut to crack, but it's something that is there. And in, in my view, I think that it's, it's the, the, the uh, uh, complexities here of whether you engage, whether you uh, take a more martial posture, and what the mix of all of that ought to be. I've been arguing for years that we should be, you know, find more of an engagement strategy that makes half of the North Korean elites rich and he kept the other half North Korean elites poor and that you could create some internal tensions that we might understand more. But in, in the absence of that, I think it's just very tough to, to get out of this. And I, since I worked in the Senate in the 1990s, people like Chris Hill and Professor Park have been at it much longer, is that you, you see something where we've been pushing it along and pushing it along because the costs of almost every other action are greater than, than essentially a status quo. Uh, direction and denuclearization is what we cared most about and so you're willing to invest a lot in that but if they're taking that back I think it puts you know I'm, I'm perhaps a bit uh, more worried than than I think Ambassador Hill is I think North Korea if it were to make a mistake if it were to step over line if it were to attack in some way uh, South Korea in a serious way you have people like Colin Powell who's just returned from Asia saying publicly that could lead to a series of things that end that regime. So while it may not be healthy to talk about ending the regime, North Korea could take actions that cause that itself. Because if you end up in a, in a hot conflict, it seems to me impossible to think of a survival strategy for North Korea at that but point. But even if no one wins at the end, I mean, surely If I could just... Uh, last word, yeah. Ambassador, we have 30 seconds. Yeah, uh, if I could just jump in, I'm also very worried. I think the North Koreans are going right up to the line. I think this is all about showcasing this new leader to North Korean people who obviously have But if have you know that, then how can't, going how, right can't up to the line. It? Well, it's not easy to defuse it. We are not North Koreans. Right, but not and, play up uh, to we it, have though. clearly, We have been prepared. We've been prepared to sit down with them, to negotiate. They have shown zero interest in negotiation. Uh. So I think we need to be very clear about who is starting this dance. I mean, it is not the United States that wants a crisis here. It's the North Koreans. So that is the problem. And I completely agree with Steve that if they keep this up, there could well be a reaction from the South Koreans, who they have also rudely and brutally attacked. And so I think you could get into some kind of shooting war. I think it's very dangerous. Uh, actually, last word, Professor, uh, Professor Park. Yeah, I, I think it's mistaken to assume that North Korea wants war over peace. Uh, they need a peace for, for the economic reason. Uh, it, if, if it's, let's, let's assume, assume uh, visualize the un unthinkable, uh, some sort of substantial warfare. You have a South Korea and, of course, U.S. bases there physically so vulnerable to North Korean attack. Whereas North Korea is not that vulnerable. You have uh, tunnels and uh, you have uh, subway systems so all people can hide there. So immediately, the, if, you, if you, you know, the outcome of, of, of confrontation uh, in, in terms of number of casualties, I don't know who will have more casualties. Absolutely, South Korea will be uh, devastated. So these things we have to put everything uh, considering in the future. So, by all means, we have to pre uh, prevent this one. And North Korea, Kim Jong Un is right now prepared than any time before, uh, 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 before to negotiate its nuclear nuclear preparedness away because that's what China wants. That's what everyone else wants. That's the only card that they have. That if the price is right, that price must include security assurance, so to speak. Professor Han Shik Park, thank you very much. Ambassador Christopher Hill, thank you. Steve Clements, thank you as Great well. Evening. And that's all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now.